And so in this first four weeks, we're going to study the women of, of faith, these legends. And then the next series, or it's actually part two of this series, it's still legends. But in June, we're going to study the men of faith. And we're going to look at some four men that were just legendary, lived legendary lives. Let's jump to our theme verse again in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 1, it says, because all those legends in verse 11 are there, it says, therefore, since we're surrounded by all these legends, these, these great cloud of witnesses, he says, um, let us, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And, and, and I, I want to mention that he doesn't say that, and the Bible doesn't say this just be, to, to point out, like in a negative way, like, hey, you got some things you need to work on. It's just making the, the fact known, like, hey, in life, sin's going to attach itself to you. Isn't that true? Like, hey, just in life, it's going to happen. Sin is just going to attach itself to you, and, and you have to make a conscious effort every day to shed the weight of sin, to just, just to identify it and to get rid of stuff that is constantly trying to attach itself. And I even love how he kind of distinguishes between sin that entangles, but also he says everything that hinders um, kind of to say like, hey, there are some things in your life that maybe it's not a sin. It's not black and white like sin, but there are some things in your life that's hindering you from running the race with perseverance. So there's some things you're carrying, some weight, and they may not be a sin. It's just, it's just you, you're not, it's hurting your race. It's affecting the call that God has put on your life. It's affecting you to run the race that God designed for you. The one marked out, it says, for you. There is a specific race that God has called you to run. And sometimes we allow sin, sometimes it's not sin, but it's something that's just tangling us up in the process. He says, man, since we got all these legends cheering us on and we have them, we can look at their lives, let's get rid of all that stuff and let's run like they ran. Let's run the race and let's win like they won. Man, they had victory, they did great things. Let's run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And so every week in this series, what we've done is just kind of called one one female at a time down from the great grandstands of heaven and and we're really just picturing this this creatively that man what would it look like if we could if we could they're they're there they're watching us but wouldn't it be so cool if we can actually you know they jump off the page of their bible and run with us and teach us from their wisdom and their life message and so we're we're kind of taking each character of the bible their life message and and and, and teaching in a creative way as like what would they say to us if they could run one lap around the track in our race. And so today, um, we're going to call down from the stands, Rebecca. And Rebecca's going to run a lap with us. And, and Rebecca's going to teach us from her, from her very short, it's a very short, you know, part of the Bible that Rebecca shows up in. Here's what I want you to know about Rebecca. Um, Rebecca is the daughter-in-law of Abraham. And Abraham, as a lot of you know, Abraham was, uh, was given a promise from God that he was going to be the father of many nations. He was going to have these multitude of children. But here he is, upwards of uh, plus 100. He's got one kid, Isaac. One, and Isaac isn't have a, doesn't even have a wife yet. So, so he's getting a little concerned. There's a problem with the, with the situation. And so Rebecca is coming out of the stands now with this small story. And I believe what she would say, she would say what, what again, what every one of these legends would tell us. Uh, she would tell us what, what, what she has to say is like your Bible is marked with this principle. It is, it is from Old Testament to New Testament. Jesus spoke on this principle that Rebecca is going to share with us today. It, it, it is just, if you, if you want to live a legendary life, you need to learn this principle. Okay, this is something that marks every legend. Every legend in the Bible was not, they, they, they didn't, they're not legends and remember today and celebrated today because of uh, just the great things that they had. They're legends and legendary. They, lead, they led legendary lives, not because of what they had, but because of what they gave, okay? They lived their life in such a way that was just marked by, by giving and not getting. So here's what I believe Rebecca would say. For when people ask for your help, give generously to others. Give generously, like make eternal investments. Live with an eternal perspective. Give generously to others, and, and this doesn't just mean your money, you guys. I'm talking about everything. Like, give generously. Give up your time to others. Give up your energy and your, your focus and your gifts and your hugs and your encouraging words, and just give generously to others. I believe Rachel would jump out of the stands, and she would, she would tell us about the impact that her seemingly small act of generosity had. It changed history, what she did her generosity. 
It, it changed, it, it impacted our lives even today, it did. So let me set up the story with you in your notes, Genesis chapter 24. Let me set it up for you though, because Abraham's getting older. He's on the, on the plus side of 100 now, Isaac. See, Isaac's getting older now and he's his only child. And so he's a little afraid because Isaac's about the age where, where he's starting to check out girls and stuff and he's thinking about his future. And, 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 and Abraham's a, a little fearful because they're living in a land that is, that is uh, he's afraid he's gonna find a wife that does not worship the same God. They don't have the same values and morals. So he's like, he's afraid of that. Not only that, but in their custom, the, the mom and dads would pick the spouses for their kids. They didn't. Which, as a father of three kids, how many you know how luck? How many like that one right there, huh? Yep, that's one I want to bring back. I actually told I, I've told my daughters. I told them, hey, you'll know he's the right one when I tell you he's the right one. That's that's how you know he's the right one. He come and tell me. Until then, you know you're mine. <laughs> so I like that one about that custom. But anyway, he, so Abraham um, he gets his chief servant and he says, here's what I need you to do. Isaac's getting older. I got this promise. We need to we need to find him a wife. So I need you to go back to my homeland and get someone from our homeland that has our same morals and values and, 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 and bring her back with us. So he gets his chief servant and he, he gives him 10 camels and he loads the camel up with a whole bunch of goods and a whole bunch of uh, uh, jewelry and stuff like that to take on his trek and to give to this woman, whoever he would find and choose, which, which you got to feel the pressure for this guy, right? This chief servant, because not only does he, does he have to find, please, find a wife who's going to be pleasing to his master, Abraham, but he's got to also please Isaac, you know, and, and he's got to take this girl. He's got to find a girl, bring her back, and just and check her out. What'd you think? What'd you think? Did I do a good job? This pressure for this guy has got to be has got to be huge. Okay, so he goes out on this journey. He finally arrives in Abraham's home uh, land in Genesis chapter twenty four, verse twelve. He starts praying. Right, that's a good thing. Like God, help me out with this. Look, he prayed, "Oh Lord, God of my master Abraham." Give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing beside this spring. And then he does something that I don't recommend right here, you guys. He, do, he throws out a fleece. He, you know what that means? Like fleecing. It's basically when, and I do not recommend this. It's when you go, hey, God, I'm going to do this. And if you do this, it means you want me to do, or I'm, gonna, or, or I'm not going to do it unless I see, God, that you do this and this, and then I'll do it. That's called fleecing. It shows up a lot in the Old Testament. And, and, and I'm... Listen, you guys, this is, this is very important because I don't want you to operate like this. In the New Testament, you never, it's not shown one time. Not one time is fleecing shown. You know why? Because you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. That's why. Okay, they didn't have the Holy Spirit. So it was a guessing game for them. For us, we walk by faith, led by the Holy Spirit. So fleecing is not a good way to to live your life and be led uh, by God. It really isn't. It's like, okay, God, if you want me to stop here at Dunkin' Donuts, then, then you're, there's going to be a parking space right up front. <laughs> then what you do, you drive around 10 times, right? So that person leaves. <laughs> oh, thank you, God. I'm, I'm getting my donut on today, right? It's just not a good way to live your life. Okay, so then he goes on. He says, look, uh, I'm standing beside the spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming to draw water. So it's about the time of the day where they come and get the water from the well. May it be that, here's the fleece, when I say to the girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, sure, drink, and I'll water your camels too. So if she says that line, that's the line, God. So she says that line. I know that's the, that's the one. Let her be the one that you've chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I'll know that you have shown kindness to my master. And that seems like, you know, not a tough request that she would, you know, feed the camels or, you know, give the camels water and stuff. I'm going to show you why it was a pretty huge deal in a moment. It says before he had finished praying, though, Rebecca came out with a jar on her shoulder. So this would have been like a, a two to five gallon jar she's lugging around on her shoulder, okay? And so the servant asks her, um, you know, to, he says the line, hey, can I have... Can, I, can you let it down and give me a drink? And she responds, sure, and I'll give your camels a drink too. And so there it is. There's the line, in which it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but I put some math on the, on the screen up here to show you just how big a deal this was. He had 10 camels. 10 camels can, so a camel can drink 20 gallons of water. That's the minimum amount of gallons a camel could drink at the end of the day. This was a long journey they were on. This is the very minimum, okay? So that is 10 times 20 gallons is 200 gallons of water drawn with a five-gallon jug, which means, you know, Rebecca had some biceps, right? She's, she's a strong, kind of like these right here. 
Why are you laughing so loud? Jeez. Okay, so he, she goes, and it takes, it takes about 20 gallons drawn with a five-gallon jar, about 40, that is 40 trips. Now, let's get on the conservative side how long it takes per trip. Let's say it was three, and that's very conservative, three, conservative, three minutes per trip. That is a two-hour, it went from, sure, I'll get you, I'll give you a drink of water, to a two-hour trip of, and, and in the text, if you go read the Bible, it actually says that, that, that Rebecca descended to get the water from the well, which means if she descended, that she had to come back and ascend. So she's 40 trips to the five gallon downhill, uphill, downhill, up here. Man, this girl was yoked. You know what I'm saying? She was, so this wasn't, this, this wasn't a, 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 just like a little ask. This was huge, and I think this attitude right here is what stands in stark contrast to the prevalent attitude today in our society, because we live in, in, in a society today that is, what's the least I can do mentality? What is, what is uh, you know, what's, what's the easy way? What, what can I get out of this? Or even better, in fact, the attitude today is, I don't want to do anything, but I want something anyway. Any, can, can I have something for it anyway? That's the attitude today, and right people, Rebecca would come down into our race that we're running. She'd say, dude, you got it all wrong, man. You got it all wrong. Instead, do crazy things like Jesus said. When people ask for your cloak, give them your coat as well. That's the, like go the extra mile for people. Give generously to others. This flies in the, in the face of like the entitlement mentality that we see in our culture today, and why would she tell us this to give generosity to others, to, so that we can be nice to people and just share? No, I'm telling you, it's so much. It's so much bigger than just that. And the servant sees her heart and in the response, and he says, "That's it. It's her." And he unloads from these ten camels all these goods, and he pours it on her. He gets all this jewelry and puts all this jewelry on her. And right there, he grabs a ring, and he proposes to Rebecca on behalf of Abraham and Isaac, to which Rebecca sees the jewelry. And what does she say right there, ladies? Oh, yeah. She hadn't even seen the dude yet, right? She hadn't even seen the guy yet. And she's like, like, if this is how Isaac rolls, I do. I do. Let's go. Okay. Which is just funny, you know, the way they did things back then. But of course, the rest of the story is, you know, it. she becomes the wife of Isaac. She becomes the, one of the great grandmothers of, of Jesus. And I just believe that she, she'd say it was just because of water, it was just water, and it was just two hours. It, was just, it just took two hours of going above and beyond, and I'm convinced that she'd come along and say, give generously to others. She'd say, like, you don't know how short this life is to live, and you don't know what kind of impact and a difference you can make with the stuff you got. Like, give generously to others. So I, I believe she'd tell us a few principles. There's four Rebecca principles I'm calling them today. Take some notes with me. Here's, I believe, what Rebecca would say. Number one, that you can't be generous and legalistic at the same time. You can't be generous and legalistic at the same time, meaning you can't count, right? You can't be like, okay, how much have I done and they done? Because at its, at its core, generosity is not a give to get mentality. It is, it, is, it is not that. God is, listen church, God is looking for a willing heart. That's what he wants. He wants a, a willing heart. So even like, you know, with, with the tithe and, and some of you... The tithe is not supposed to be, because some, some people think, oh, I got a tithe, or else, you know, God's going God's gonna to curse me. That's not, no, 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 come on. God doesn't curse anybody. Jesus is not going to curse you. The, here's the fact. The fact of the matter is, you live in a cursed world. That's the truth. This world and earth is cursed, and your money's cursed, and what God's trying to do is get the curse off of you. He's trying to get the curse out of your money in your household, and so what generosity does is just that. It breaks the stronghold of curse, and part of my, I believe part of my job as a pastor is get the guilt off of you, because some of you walk in guilt here, and, and, and you don't need to. There's no need to walk in guilt here, okay? Second Corinthians, look what the Bible says, Second Corinthians 9 and 7. It says, each man should give what he's decided in his what? In his heart to give, not reluctantly. So don't be a miser, don't be a Scrooge, but don't do it just because someone slick told you how to do it or when to do it. Don't do that. Under compulsion, no, for God loves a cheerful giver, he says. That's, it's honestly one of my favorite parts of coming to church is, is, is giving. Is when I get to give, it feels so good to like sow into it and like thank God that he's given me the ability to give and to work I didn't have room to put it in your notes, but verse 8 says that those who have this willing spirit, look at this, this is huge, that God is able to make all grace 
abound to you. Now, again, we don't give to get. We don't do that. But, but generosity moves the heart of God. All right, when we posture ourselves this way and we, and we use the blessing of God to be a blessing in other people's life, God looks at that and goes, oh, you're going to do that? Okay, I'm going to make sure you abound. How? He says, in all things, at all times, having all that you need. How many of you would like to live like that? Come on, that's, that's, that's living right there. He says, he, says, he goes on uh, that, that it will abound. You'll abound in every good work. That means you'll abound in your marriage. You're going to abound in your career. You're going to abound in your relationships. You're going to abound in your emotions. You're going to, he says, you will abound in every good work. And I'm just saying, Rebecca would come along and say, be generous to others. Here's number two. She'd say, you can't walk the second mile until you walk the first. And again, I'm not trying to pick on, on, on any generation here, but, but previous generations knew this better than my generation and, and, and the younger generations that, that we have today. We have previous generations understood us, the sacrifice that it takes to reap. It, it, now it's like we want it, we want it now. We don't like waiting for things. We don't like working for things. It's, it's, even the government is bought into this and our culture and society. It's just like it, it, we, we've lost this concept. Like we, we say, oh, that looks good. I want that. I want my life to be like this. And this is what I want. Even, like, even good things. I want good things, but, but we don't understand. Like You have to walk the first mile in order to get to the second mile. In order to have the fruit of a harvest, you need to start working the ground and planting some seed. You need to get to work if you want some fruit to eat from your life. And it's something that is just kind of lost in today's society is this idea that, that we, don't, we don't understand the sacrifice anymore to reap the harvest of our future. We actually need to work now. You can't walk the second mile until you walk the first. And Rebecca would say, I didn't have much. I just have biceps in a jar. That's all I had. And what she do? Look what Jesus, Jesus says this in Luke 16, 10, that whoever can be trusted with little can also be trusted with much. But whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So what this is saying is the Lord is watching because some, look, because some people say like, oh, if I had that, then I'd be generous. If I had, if I had that person's time, the time they have, then I'd be able to to serve other people. If I, if I had that person's gift or that person's intellect, oh, I would, if I had that person's resources, then I would. And Jesus is saying right here in this verse, he's saying, no, you won't. No, you won't. Not if you're not faithful with the little I've given you, because the little I've given you, I've given you some resources now, what have you done with it? I've given you some opportunities right now, and what did you do with the opportunities now? I've given you some time now. What did you do with the time now? Jesus is saying he's looking at that. And as, as we're not faithful with the little, he's not going to, he's going to find someone. He's going to look at someone else and go, oh, they're abounding. The, oh, this person, right? they're faithful. I'm going to make sure they abound. I'm going to pour it out over here on their life. Because if you're faithful with little, he says, you're going to be faithful with much. Here's the third one. And that is, she'd say, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead. All right, you can't. This, this principle comes from a very, it's a short book called, it's the treasure principle, a book called the treasure principle. I forget who the author was, but this is the thesis statement that you can't take it with you. You can't take anything from this life to the next life, you guys, but you can send it ahead, okay? You've never seen a U-Haul following a hearse, right? You, you don't, because you can't take it with you, okay? I, I read this story of this one miser that, that, you know, told his wife, he was getting old in age, and he told his wife, like, when I die, I want you to bury me with all my money. All my money. I, I worked for it. It's going with me in the grave. I want the, I want the satisfaction and peace of knowing I'm, I'm buried with my money. And so sometime later, he dies. He goes first. And so they're doing the funeral. She's got the open, open casket. And before they were closing the casket, she says, hold on. She got this box. Brings a box out, puts it in there. And, and the friend of the family, she knows the situation. What he had asked for was watching. And she just amazed at her doing this. They, they close it, lower it. And she, after the funeral, she came up to her and said, hey, I, I'm amazed that you would honor his, his final wishes like that. That was so honorable. Did you really, did you really put all his money in that, in that box? And she said, yes, I did. I wrote him a check. <laughs> Come on. You can't take it with you. Okay. You can't take it with you but you can send it ahead. This is, this is what I mean by it. Jesus says this, Matthew chapter six. Jesus says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Like it's, 
rust is going to happen and decay and moth and, and, and thieves can break in and steal it. But he says, store up for yourselves, like send it ahead of you. You can send it ahead of you. You can store it up in heaven. And there, there's no moth's going to touch it. No rust's going to touch it. No one can steal it. No one, no one can touch it. It is stored for you in heaven. Jesus is saying, like, like, don't just make your life all about treasures on earth. Send it ahead of you. Live with an eternal perspective. Rebecca would say, just be generous to others when they ask. Live your life in such a way, which, by the way, I really think that every, every legend would say this. It's, what's, it's what makes them legendary. But I also believe that everybody who we know and love, who has gone on to be with the Lord, if they could tell us, I believe they would tell us the same thing, man. I believe they'd say, hey, man, in light of what I know now, in light of heaven, in light of what, what I know in eternity, and in light of what I know about earth, like, Man, I would I just do it differently. I would have given more. I, I would have given more and made a bigger difference with what with what I had. Here's the last thing that she would say, and that is you can't wait for the feeling. Feelings will follow. You can't wait for the feeling. Feelings will follow. This is a good one, you guys. Right? Put like a star by this one because this applies to every area of your life. So when you're tempted, you don't live your life by feelings. No, no, no. You, you, you live your life by faith, all right? Don't, don't live by pressure. Live by principle, okay? The, the, don't live your life by feeling. Your feelings will follow your decisions and choices that you make. I don't think Rebecca woke up that morning and thought to herself, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a, a workout this morning. I'm just going to two hours work out for a stranger feeding his camels. I don't think she wanted. Listen, I don't think she felt like doing that. But she made a choice. She made a choice to live by a principle that she knew God honored, and that if she were to sow into something eternal, that she would reap a harvest uh, tenfold back to her. I believe she knew that, and that's why she lived this way. Don't wait for the feeling. Some of you, oh, I don't feel led to I don't feel led to serve. I don't feel led to, to do that. I don't feel led to get into a group. You need to get the lead out of you is what you need to do, okay? All right, just, just let, your, let your choices lead. Lead your life by principle. Make the choices that you know God honors and your feelings will follow, okay? Look what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21. He says, forever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now listen, this is, a lot of people mix this up. They say, hey, wherever your heart is, your treasure will be. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus says, look at this. Jesus says, your treasure leads and your heart follows it. Do you see that? Okay, your treasure will lead. So meaning wherever you want your heart, and wherever you want your heart to be, you let your treasure lead. Put your treasure wherever you want your heart because your heart will be wherever your treasure is. Are you guys seeing that with me? One of the best decisions I've made with Veronica is the decision that we made a decision that our life will be marked by generosity, by what we can give, not what we can get. We've made the decision in every area that we are going to, we're going to use our gifts for people and for God's glory. We're going to use our time that we have for people and for God's glory. We're going to use the money that we have. We said we're going to tithe. We're going to be a tithing and above and beyond tithe family because our life is going to be marked by what we're giving, not what we're getting. So when we're placed with decisions and life decisions and choices, we don't weigh it out to how's this going to make us and our family? We say, God, how does this, what does this look like to you, God? How can we put you first in this? What are you? And we live a God first life. And it's one of the best decisions that we have ever made. God has, I'm telling you, a hundredfold paid us back in so many areas. And again, I'm not just talking about finances. I'm talking about your heart of generosity. That's it. Where you live an others-focused life. Um, a couple of... Uh, Months ago, actually, it was last October, we, we launched the Dream Center downtown or in, in Union, right, on, on Union. And, and some of you know that we did that and launched that. Some of, you, some of you don't know what that is. It's our mission outpost. It's our outreach arm to our city that we, we believe in. And it's already happening that we are seeing our city being restored, lives being changed. But when we made this step, Discovery Church, it was a face step, wasn't it? Like, we didn't have... We really didn't have the resources to do it, the means to do it, but we said, we're going to do it by faith. It's going to happen. And so we have, by faith, just been able to make the impact and lives being changed. Uh, and it's been amazing. It's been an amazing work. So some of you are, are, are not aware. Some of you are kind of aware and don't know all what we do there. So we created a video for you to check out what the Dream Center, because it's what we're doing. We are doing this together because of 
your generosity, our generosity, and the way the people that are serving there and giving to Discovery, we kind of, we're making, we're making a difference. So why don't you check out this video? So the Dream Center is something that's not just a building. It's something that started in the heart of people at Discovery Church. It began with a group of people wanting to do more for our community, but also realizing that there was so much hurt in our community, um, so much that God wanted us to be doing. We get comfortable in our life and doing our own thing that we forget about what's, what's happening in our community. So the Dream Center started with a few um, major causes. We have four of them. The first one is addiction. We understood that in our community, drug addiction is a huge thing street drugs or something that people deal with very commonly. Everyone in Bakersfield knows someone who either deals with drug addiction or has been um, a part of an addiction. So we, tr we try to tackle drug addiction. And we have a amazing uh, recovery group on Thursday nights where we just started a few months ago. Four months ago we started. We started the class about a month ago and we have over 50 people um, who showed up on our first night and have been continuously coming and it's been amazing. Poverty is something that we overlook and we forget about that it exists in our community. Uh, we live in our own comfortable lives and we drink our Starbucks and we go about our life and we forget that people are dealing with just being hungry every day or not having clothes. Um, so we focus every second Saturday of the month and we open up our food pantry and we have been able in the last four months to feed over 500 families every month. And then we like to open up our clothing pantry. Our clothing pantry clothes over 300 families a month. Families are able to come in who don't have sweaters, who don't have blankets, who don't have shoes. Often men who are trying to look for jobs or even just keep their job will come in and find pants and different work type of clothing that they need just to survive and continue to do what they need to do to provide for their family. Youth mentorship at the Dream Center is called Project One Age. I love Project One Age and the name of it because it literally means the one. The project of finding the one, going after the one. When we look at numbers and we think about how many youth are in trouble or how many youth need a mentor in our community, it can feel overwhelming. But when we focus on the one, we focus on helping one youth at a time, it's amazing. And so what we do on Friday nights, we have an onboarding time where we have tribe night and we welcome all of the youth that are living in hotels and living, um, sometimes even homeless youth living on the streets of Bakersfield. And they're welcome to come in, we feed them, we hang out with them and we connect with them and then we connect them to a mentor. Where then they're mentored, the, the mentor comes in and helps them with school, helps them with um, connecting with different resources that they need, that the family needs. And uh, through this program right now, we are serving over 30 youth. And the youth, we have seen tremendous growth in them. We've seen children who have came in failing in their grades to having honor roll and having great grades. And the school districts are starting to reach out to us and asking us, you know, what are you doing with these kids? And all we're doing is we're coming alongside them, we're loving them, and we're being a voice for them. A voice where maybe they don't have one. And so it's been amazing and it's been one of those places where, again, you can feel like there's just no hope. There's just too many statistics, the numbers are too high. But when you just focus on one child at a time, it's amazing what, what can happen. The Dream Center is located in what the city calls the red light district in our community. The red light district is filled with hotels. So we understand that it is a great mission for us to take on families and people living in hotels. We have children who are born into hotels all the time. One of the things that happened a few weeks before we started what we call Safe Care Kids, which is a program for children to stay safe at night while their mothers are either working on the streets or mothers are living in hotels. We, we like to take them in and keep them safe throughout the night. So they come for an overnight care where we feed them, we clothe them, we keep them safe overnight. But what had happened a few weeks before we started safe care was there was a three and a five year old who were shot and killed right in front of the Dream Center. And it was a hard thing to hear because we were gonna get started that week 
And so for that to have happened, it was definitely a defining moment for us. It was a, it was almost like a God moment for us to see that we are called to do this. And we are going to do that. Um, we're going to be bold and trust that we can go and make a difference. Sometimes when you look at the statistics and you look at what the families are doing and, sur and how they're surviving in hotels, you almost feel like it's hopeless. Like there's no hope for, for families living in hotels or people in those areas in this red light district. But there is hope and we can be a part of making a difference. We can go out there and we can do the simplest things as simple as just loving on a three and a five year old, as simple as just giving them some food and allowing them to feel like a kid just for a few hours. It's our heart and it's what we're gonna do and we're, we're not going anywhere. Get involved at the Dream Center because there's more to life. And if you think that the things that are happening in the red light district in our community or in areas where they're not safe, that it won't affect you, it will. It'll affect our children. It'll affect our future. Our safe areas are not safe because you live away from where the problems are. Get plugged in because there's people out there who need you. There's people who are suffering and are hurt and they need you to reach out and make a difference. And they need you. They're not excuses that we think. They're not because they choose to be out there. But their circumstances have not been your circumstances, so reach out. Amen. Isn't that awesome? I don't show you that to, like, to, to boast or anything like that. I show you that because the church was always meant to exist outside the walls that we've created. You guys, we were, we, were, we were made to make a difference. We really, we really were, and we can do something. Maybe you say, like, I, I, I don't know what I have. You can. You have, you have something. I, and I just believe Rebecca would come, and she'd say, man, my small act of kindness, I just I didn't know it was going to make such a big impact, and we can make a difference, you guys. So before she leaves, for, before Rebecca leaves, um, let's, let's listen to the legends and give three last words of encouragement from Rebecca here. And that is, number one, that even the smallest acts of generosity make a difference. Even the smallest act, she'd say, look, it was only water and it was only two hours. If I would have known, man, that, that, I, that this, I would have been getting all this jewelry and stuff and been all included in history, I would have given more. I would have given it all if, if, if I would have known, you know. But she didn't know. It's just one small act of kindness. And by the way, it doesn't have to be your money. It's not about your money, guys. It could be just the fact that I'm going to live my life in, in life in such a way that even in the small things, I'm just going to be generous. I'm going to be others focused. I'm going to serve and not focus on what I'm getting all the time. And I love this about our church. I really do. I love you guys. You guys posture yourself so much like this. Our dream team, they just do the, the, the smallest acts here at Discovery done with huge hearts, and it's making a big difference. Everyone on the Dream Team knows that the lives that are being changed, everyone that's getting baptized today, that commit their lives to Christ, that are getting their marriages restored, that are receiving healing in different ways, and churches being planted, and Dream Standards, everybody knows, every person, whether they're at a door or on a stage or in kids ministry, they all know that they're a part of it. Every single one of them are doing a small act with a big heart, and it's making a huge difference. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 42, that if anyone gives a cup of cold water to any one of these little ones because he is my disciple. Any of Jesus' disciples in here today? Any Jesus' disciples in here, you guys? He says, I'll tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. That's apodidomai in the Greek, and it literally means I'll pay you back when you get to heaven. That's what Jesus is saying. I'll pay you back when you get to heaven. Here's the second thing I think Rebecca would say to us, and that is that when you give, the impact of your generosity will outlive you. Yeah, it just keeps on going. Your generosity keeps going, going, because you got to think about what we do, how, how, many, how it impacts the generations to come. And I hope to be a church. I really do. Should, should the Lord tarry, I hope to be a church that sets the next church up for success, that our ceiling becomes their floor. And, and really, honestly, and I want to I make something very clear to everybody here, that we would posture our heart the right way before God. What we are seeing happening at Discovery Church, the amazing things that is just crazy, the movement that we are a part of, and the lives being changed, 
we are reaping what we did not sow. We did not, we, we did not earn or deserve the fruit that is coming upon Discovery Church. Are you listening to me, you guys? This, there are so many other people that have worked on the lives of the people that are coming now that we are a beneficiary of. There are so many people that have been praying and working the soil of Bakersfield and Southwest Baker. So many people, generations before we stand on their shoulders and now a benefit and God willing that we would be, we would set up the next generation as well. That our, our ceiling would become their floor. And there's two ways that we're going to do that. Two ways. that At Discovery, the way that we are going to impact the next generation, two primary ways. One is through our church planting. That church planting, listen, we are going to, that's going to be our cost. We're going to pay for that. We're going to resource that. We're going to work the soil for that. But the next generation is going to get all the fruit. Okay, that's and so there'll be some fruit that we get absolutely, but the next generation is going to get the harvest of what we sow in church planting. You guys, the the second way that we are going to impact the next generation, primary way here at Discovery, is through our dream centers. We have one that we've launched here in Bakersfield, but every city that we're launching a Discovery Church, we are we're going to launch a dream center as well. And listen, we're going to pay for that Discovery. We're going to resource that. We are going to work the soil for that. And the next generation is going to reap the fruit of that blessing. The next generation is going to see those cities restored fully and completely. It, we may not see it completely in our, in our time, in some of our time. But you know what? The next generation is going to see the completion of our work. Amen, somebody? Okay, the, the impact of your, your generosity, you guys, it outlives you. That's what makes it legendary. That's how you leave a legacy. Here's what Jesus had to say about it. John chapter 4, 38. He said, I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Here's the last thing that Rebecca would say to us, and that is that when you give, you're really giving to the Lord. I love that we're ending today like this. It's just when you give, you're not giving to people. You're not giving to a cause. You're giving to the Lord. Here's the verse, and I have one final verse after this one. It's not in your notes. Look at this one, though, with me. Matthew 25, verse 40. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did it for me. So you know when you went and fed that homeless person? You didn't really touch their, you didn't just touch their life. Jesus says, you touched me. You know, that person that was down and you saw them down and you gave them a hug. You didn't need to, but you went out of your way. You didn't just encourage them and touch them. Jesus says, you touched me. When you, when you served in that way, when you gave in that way, it wasn't just touching them. Jesus is saying, you did get, do all things as unto the Lord. Amen, everybody? So, so then what's my next step, Pastor Jason? How do, I, how do I live like this? I want to I, I wanna, I wanna be marked by this principle. I want, I want to leave a legacy. I want to I impact generations to come. I don't, how, do I, how do I do this? Because I might, I might not have a lot of resources or a lot of time or a lot of gifts or a lot of things to offer. So what's my next step? I want to read you a verse up here on your screens from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to read you the end, uh, verses 20 and 21, the last couple of verses there. So what's my next step. What do I do? Here's what I want you to do. God helping you, he says. Take your everyday, ordinary life. Your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life. So basically, whatever you got, whatever you have, and place it before God as an offering. Give it to God. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Don't become so well-adjusted to the entitlement mentality, the selfish mentality, the, the give-to-get mentality. Don't get so accustomed to your culture. Instead, fix your attention on God. And when you do that, he says, you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you. He's giving you opportunities and time and resources. It may be a little. Some of you may have a lot. But you need to readily recognize what he has put before you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God is bringing the best out of you. Verse 20, Scripture tells us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. 
Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. And I love how he closes this. He says, don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Come on, let's bow our heads across the worship center, church.